Stop me if you heard this one. So, Call of Cthulhu, Chill, and Delta Green walk into a hotel. Welcome to Gazing Into Darkness. I am Mike Dukes. Ah, the air just turned off. That is a good thing. So what is Gazing Into Darkness? What is this show gonna be? Is it gonna be is it reviews? Eh, not so much. I love horror and mystery RPGs. I mean, I, there are some others I also really adore, but that's kind of my thing. And if you really think about it, there are a lot of games out there that are horror, mystery, what have you. They do essentially the same thing. So why would you play game A instead of game B, C, D? And what really got me to thinking about this was a couple of things. About seven, eight years ago, uh, whenever the Kickstarter for Call of Cthulhu 7th Edition uh, delivered the actual physical books. So I had those books. I wasn't sold on the changes. I had been playing 5th slash 6th. They were the same thing, let's be honest. Uh, playing that edition for years. So I was, wasn't really sold on the whole spending luck thing. I was like, eh, yeah, well. I kind of sat it on the shelf. That Gen Con year, uh, I had been hearing back then if you had talked about horror gaming or Call of Cthulhu, inevitably you would have someone mention Chill. Either they didn't start with Cthulhu, they started with Chill, or they preferred Chill. As a fan of Call of Cthulhu, that fascinated me because if I loved Cthulhu and these other people loved this Chill game, would I love the Chill game? but it was out of print. So when a Kickstarter was done for a third edition, I didn't back the Kickstarter. I was still kind of leery, but when that Gen Con, I knew what booth it was going to be in. So I went and I grabbed a copy and I flipped through it. And I was talking to a friend of mine who was also kind of a big Cthulhu guy because he too was interested in chill. He had seen, you know, it was going to be at Gen Con. And I was telling him about it. And his first question was, hold up. Why would I play that game? Why would I not, if I wanted to play that kind of thing, why would I not just do it with Call of Cthulhu? I already own the books and I already know the system. And at the time I didn't have an answer. I mean, technically, yeah. Why, why wouldn't you? Why, why don't you? People do it all the time. I mean, look at how many things are being kind of twisted to fit fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. Just because so many people love that system and just don't feel like learning a different system. They, that's what they like. So let's just grab this and make it part of it. And then that following spring, I got the physical copy of Delta Green, the Agent's Handbook. So I've got three games. I'm a, hands down, I'm gonna tell you right now. Yes, I'm a Cthulhu fanboy, but Delta Green, that's my game. Ride or die, being Delta Green. That's, that's, I've got a Delta Green challenge coin in my wallet, if that tells you anything. I'm just gonna put that out there. I love Delta Green. So anyway, I'm looking at these three systems, and of course, I love Delta Green. I love, it's very, uh, no holds barred way of doing things. That That is right up my alley. So I was like, yes, Delta Green. But as time passed and I was looking again at Chill, I, I loved the setting and the background of Chill. Some of the, set, uh, the system stuff kind of, I wasn't sold on, but the setting, it was one of those that had a, a fairly deep history to it that didn't give too much away and was enough that left tantalizing little tendrils here and there that you could easily pick up in your own game. I love that sort of thing. And it had it in spades. So I went back and I was looking at Chill again and it was just that system, man. Something about it, it, it 
it bugged me. But those three games in particular were the reason for this show because all three are horror games. All three are you're playing essentially normal people fighting these hideous horrors. And all three are percentile based systems. So yeah, why would you play chill and not Call of Cthulhu? Or why wouldn't you just use the chill setting with the Call of Cthulhu system or Delta Green? Why don't you just run all your Call of Cthulhu adventures through Delta Green or vice versa? Or well, you're pulling Hunter the Reckoning or, or Vassin. There's so many games out there. You could you can mix and match. So why? What is it is about a specific system, a specific game that should make you and your players salivate to play and not just port bits of it over? That's what the show is going to be about. I want to do deep dives. I want to talk about why you would enjoy the game, why your players might, why maybe they might not. And just look, and I will compare to other games because it's going to be inevitable. Particularly, I've noticed um, I'm about to start, I believe next week, to start an actual play campaign of Vassin. And if you look at Vassin and you look at Chill, you're like, wait, wait, oh, huh, huh, that's, there are a lot of similarities. But to start this show out, I wanted to use Chill because that's the one that's kind of just, it's stuck in the back of my head. So Chill 3rd Edition. Like I said, I'd heard about it, never played it. So what is it? What do you do? Is it like Cthulhu where you're just kind of like normal people and stumble upon some hideous cosmic thing and have to deal with it? No, no. That's one thing that differentiates it from, say, Call of Cthulhu. The default, not so much now, with 7th edition, they do give you a uh, organization to kind of be a part of. But a lot of one-shots for Call of Cthulhu, yeah, it's, you're just everyday people stumbling upon, so you have one bad day, man, it's a really bad day. But if you want to go beyond that, then it's the question of, I almost died. Why would I want to continue doing this? I actually had a player in a Cthulhu game. He was like, I, I don't understand why my author would want to continue doing this. He almost died, um, almost went insane. I'm pretty sure he could write a few books about that. Why would he want to risk his life? I couldn't blame him. He's right. So the way uh, Chill tackles that is that there is an organization known as SAVE. It is a society of individuals who know about the unknown. That is their term for the horrors that are out there. I know, very original, the unknown. Well, it gets better. Uh, Save got its start back in the 1600s, I believe. So back then, the unknown seemed like a pretty good name. But the big thing about Chill that differentiates it from all those other games, and it's something I'm going to be coming back to you again and again and again, is the balance between the forces of light and dark. So you're part of safe. That's when, you're, when you make your characters, you're not just making your characters at the table, you're also creating your headquarters. You get to determine where it is, what it is. It's cool because... Uh, Quite literally, your headquarters could be a big mansion, uh, a room in a hotel, a floor of a hotel, uh, a trailer, basement. They even make mention of two brothers whose headquarters is just an impala that they ride around the country in and they keep all their equipment in the trunk. Huh. So the headquarters thing, uh, save at its height was a global organization with houses, that's what they call the headquarters. So you would have the London house, the Amsterdam house, the New York house, Chicago, New Orleans. And they were very successful. Um, you have an option when you create your characters to have something access to something called the art. 
It is not the ability to draw more than stick figures. It is a closest I can think of would be a uh, psionic abilities. Um, maybe you can create protective circles or you can have psychometry so you can sense the history of something by touching it. Maybe you have telekinesis, that sort of thing. Once they discovered the art, which was very early on, they didn't make the connection until much later, but uh, the theory uh, in game would save was that by learning the art from the very beginnings and as they spiraled outward with new abilities, stronger abilities, and mind you, this is not like X-Men kind of stuff at all. This is, when I say stronger, it's, I can lift that cup an inch off the table, that sort of thing. As they grew in that, the rotted filth that is the unknown grew also, correspondingly so. So as they grew in the art and they did more search into it and learned more about the unknown, the power of the unknown grew. And it was just a constant. So it, the theoretical question came to be, did Save inadvertently give birth to the unknown by studying that sort of thing? Save suffered a bit of hubris in the 80s and 90s. As I said, at the height, they were a global organization connected by the internet. So they could email and send files to one another. Of course, you had phone calls long before that. They never expected the unknown to use those tools against them. So imagine you think you've got the upper hand on this entity because in your mind, you kind of still hold it back as some sort of medieval sort of evil. You never think, it's not like it can be online. It's a little short-sighted when you consider someone could be possessed and get on a computer or this vampire who has been dogging you for decades. You think he, he's not going to know how to get on a computer or find someone who knows how? I mean, yes, they had safety protocols, but you find a hacker, which apparently they did. And suddenly what was happening was they were getting false information. Yes, th this house communicating with this house saying, oh yes, we, we have had dealings with that, an entity of that sort. We found it is most susceptible to this. This house is like, good, using that same methodology, thinking it's gonna work and it doesn't and the team dies. Or perhaps there's a request for aid. We have a, a very major incident occurring. We need all hands on deck. Anyone you can spare, please send them. They send them. And then when that team gets to wherever they're supposed to, this incident's supposed to be, there's no one there. Meanwhile, their house is attacked and destroyed. Or maybe a team is sent on what is supposed to be a mundane, just a haunting, should be like a day trip. And instead it's an ambush and the entire team is decimated. That sort of thing. And it was happening all over. So it got to whoever you're emailing, you've no idea if the person on the other end is, and the air just came back on. You've no idea if the person on the other end is actually who you think it is or even on a phone call, is the voice you're listening to actually the voice of the person you think it is? They got scared. All these old fogies who would, you know, ha ha ha, nothing can beat art. Well, yeah, they did. They freaked out. They closed up. So all these various houses that were surviving just shut all communications off, cut it off completely. No more emailing other people, uh-uh hardwire that shit. Phone calls? No. No, we're not writing letters. No, nothing. Oh, you want to go in person? I'm not risking my team. You do that, you're off the team. That sort of thing. 
And what did that do? That meant that there was no calling for backup. There was no calling for information, for assistance. That meant this house could be taken off the board because no one's gonna know. And this house, and this team, and this, and this. So then it got to the point where individual houses no longer knew what other houses still existed. I mean, they were afraid to reach out because who, again, how do they know whoever reaches back is who they say they are? But at a certain point, they had to do that just to learn. So you had a few of the largest houses getting together, trying to figure out, you know, what are we gonna do? And during that, in the Middle East, you had an individual who, or individuals, I guess, knew about SAVE and realized, look, what you're doing, what you did cannot continue. Not if you want SAVE to survive. They were literally fighting a war in the Middle East and they knew you had to have a cell structure, which would mean, sure, this cell may get taken out. And they may know a few people here and a few people there that you could also take out, but it ends there. A single link of the chain, not the entire chain doing it the old way, then yes, save as we know it could very well be destroyed. But if you use the cell structure, you have a far greater chance of succeeding. That met with, uh, it wasn't uh, taken all that greatly. If you, can, if you can imagine our political climate as it is now, apply it to this, you've got the old school, they're like, oh no, no, no. That's no, no, not gonna listen to her, no. We'll be fine. So there was a lot of talks. There was a conclave. They came together and finally realized, okay, yeah, let's let's try this. We'll try. So as the game begins and you make your house, that's one of the decisions you have to make is, are you a traditional house following the traditional methods or are you following a cell-like structure? And how does that play within the dynamics of the headquarters. I mean, maybe your PC is like, no, we need to be in a cell structure or we're gonna die. But the head of your house is some old school academic who strongly believes in the way things used to be. And there's gonna be some budding of heads. So it won't just be the matter of mission after mission after mission. You're gonna have that home scene. You got to deal with the fact that you're maybe watching your your friends, this headquarters, save as an entity deteriorating because of people like that. And you're gonna have to figure something out. That's cool. It makes it far more than just a horror game, which I think is great. Okay. I mentioned balance, so let's get back to that. System. It is a percentile based system. So you've got your target number, normally whatever your skill, say you're uh, trying to shoot something, that's the ranged weapon skill. Maybe you've got a 58 ranged weapon skill. I roll, I rolled an eight. If you roll under your target number, but less or, but over half, I know, weird. that's a low success. If you roll under the target number, but it's under that halfway mark, it's a high success. So what I rolled an eight would be considered a high success. Let's see if it's... Uh, so what, 20... Anyway, under like 20 something would have been uh, your, your halfway mark. A colossal success is if you roll doubles that are under your target number. So I said uh, 58 ranged weapons. If I had rolled a 55, a 44, 33, 22, uh, 11, that would, any of those, would be a colossal success. That means, yes, I succeed and then some, and there's a little something extra that I'll get to in a second. Obviously, if you roll over your target number, that is a failure. And if you roll over and roll doubles, that is a botch. And much like with a colossal success, something a little extra happens and it's not happy for you. I'll get to that in a second. That second being now. 
So aside from the dice, which is very straightforward, there is a token system divided into light and dark. Again, we're back to that balance. At the beginning of the session, a number of tokens will be placed on the table, one for each player, and then one more. They will all be light side up, which in my case, uh, this Indalo, that is a symbol for save, that would be facing upward. They would all be light facing up, except for one, which would be dark. The light ones are the ones that the players can use and utilize. The dark ones are the ones that I, as the chill master, can make use for my NPCs, evil entities, what have you. And instead of being taken off the table when they are used, they are simply flipped. So if a player chooses to use a token, they are flipping it over so it goes from being a light token to being a dark token. Meaning they can no longer access it, but I can. So what exactly can you do with these? One of the things is, okay, I said a uh, ranged weapon skill 58. Say I had rolled a 63, that would have been a failure. By flipping a token to dark, you can increase your skill by 10. And you can do this for as many tokens as you want to flip. So with my 58 skill, if I had flipped a token over, my effective skill would now be a 68. So that 63 I rolled would now be a low success. And if I really wanted to make it a high success, I could flip more tokens if I had enough available. Let's look, see what the book says as far as other uses for tokens. Okay, uh, the art. This is one of the things that caused me to pause when it came to using the chill system to run chill. Now, when you create your character, possessing the art, these psionic-like abilities, is optional. It's not something you have to pay extra points for or anything. It's just literally, do you want this? If so, okay, you're going to spend points on that. If you don't, okay, fine, you don't have it. So you could completely have an entire cast of characters that do not possess this ability. No problem. But if any of them do, to use one of their, I hate calling them powers because it's not X-Men, but if they want to use one of those art abilities, disciplines of the art, if you want to be technical, they have to flip a token. That's how it's activated. That helps keep it from being used too much, but it also helps play into, again, that balance of light and dark because you're pulling upon that power that they do believe could be the cause of the rise and the unknown to begin with. You're giving the unknown more power. Sensing the unknown. Uh, any of the characters, because once you had your first experience with the unknown, you've been touched by it. And if you choose to continue going forward and trying to fight these things, it gives you the ability to kind of have a sense for it. Maybe the hair stands up on the back of your neck. Maybe your hand itches. Any number of ways you can sense this stuff. Maybe you just get a cold chill. Unless you have the art and focus on that sort of sensing, your ability, skill-wise, is going to be a very low percentage. We're talking in the teens, probably. So rolling and succeeding at that roll is going to be hard. But if you want to flip a token dark, automatically you will be able to sense the unknown if there is any anything near you or if any powers have been used recently near you, you will know. So if you walk into the room and you just got a bad feeling, so you turn a token dark and tell the chill master, I want to sense the unknown. That's when he tells you the hair stands up on the back of your neck. 
and you can feel and hear the breathing against your right ear as if someone's standing right behind you. But you know for a fact you're the only person in that room. That sort of thing can happen. Uh, gaining insight. Say you uh, come across some new clues, but you have no idea what to do with them. You can turn a token and say, I need a gain site. And the chill master will then kind of help you piece those puzzle pieces together a bit. So it makes a little more sense. So instead of just random things that you found, you're like, oh, oh, okay. He offed her for the money and then the spirit. Yeah. These can also be used to reduce the trauma suffered uh, when you make a resolve check. That is a fancy way using their terminology of reducing damage. Another reason, again, I wanted to compare Chill, Cthulhu, and Delta Green, percentile-based, horror, and all three deal with both physical and mental damage in different ways. Here it is referred to as trauma, whether it's physical or mental, and you have to make a resolve check to try and resist Spending a turning a token allows you to uh, better do that. And then the last one is in a horror game, if you watch any horror movies, or read any horror books, or played any horror video games, death can and will happen. If you are playing a campaign, that is not a good way to go. You get invested in a character and you want to see them survive. While it can be great to have a gruesome death, that's the end of the character. So, in the event something should happen, any of the players at the table can say, no, I want to turn all the light tokens dark. And by doing that, that individual envoy will survive. So let's say uh, you've tracked a werewolf to a certain location, an old farmhouse. Some of you go in, one of you stays out. You're keeping watch because you're fairly certain it's inside. Well, you're wrong. It sneaks up, it attacks, and it rips the spine from that person who's standing guard outside. They don't even get so much as a scream off. The only sound is the ripping and shredding and the sound of blood hitting the ground. They are dead. Suddenly all the players go, whoa, flip those tokens. All the tokens are now dark, which means the balance shifts to the unknown, but that envoy will survive now. It won't be a squeaky clean survival. He won't suddenly miss. It may rip into his jacket and he may run off and bang his head and be unconscious and not know what's gonna happen next, but he will survive. something to keep in mind. But it will shift, again, that balance of light and dark, that shifts it all to the unknown. So the Chill Master now has all those tokens to do whatever he wants with. One other thing, I mentioned uh, about the success rolls. A colossal success would get you a little something extra. If an envoy rolls a colossal success, a dark token gets turned light. And I want to say Yeah, it just you don't add one, it just flips a dark one light. But if you roll a botch, the opposite. A light token will be turned dark. So again, using the werewolf example. All those tokens are now in the Chill Master's hands. So what can the Chill Master do? A lot of the same stuff an Envoy can do. Uh, adding 10 to the target number. Yep. Activating a Discipline of the Evil Way. That is the equivalent of the art for the unknown. So same kind of deal. I love this one. Inconvenience the characters in a minor but important way to complicate the situation. A classic and modern horror movies would be, okay, say uh, you have tracked 
the entity to this old farmhouse. And you know there is a cult following this entity. They have kidnapped someone and are no doubt about to sacrifice him because it's a full moon. They're in there. You can hear them chanting. You need backup. Quick, let's call backup. Oh, no. It would appear there's no cell phone reception. Or maybe they're chasing after you. Quick, get to the car. Oh, no, you're out of gas. Or a flat tire. You get the idea. It doesn't kill them, but it does inconvenience them. Uh, you can also, this is kind of funny. Again, it plays in those tropes of whether it's movie, novel, you've always got those kind of hangers on support characters that will do stupid shit and get you in trouble. Hey, the air turned off. So by turning a token light, I can have an NPC who's a support character take an action or experience something that is detrimental or dangerous to the envoys. So let's take that same example of the cultists and the entity in the farmhouse about to sacrifice somebody. Your group, you realize it's, you know, a multi underground level thing underneath this farmhouse. You see them down there. You see the sacrifice. You know this is imminent. You've got to do something. You've got your plan. All right. You're our sniper. You're going to take him, take out the entity. Okay. You guys are going to do this. You're going to do this. And. Because your car was out of gas, poor Barney, the taxi driver who brought you here, came in with you. He's completely out of his depth. I decide Barney can't take that. He's it's too much. Barney freaks out and bolts and in doing so makes a lot of racket and every cultist and the entity all suddenly look up at you. You no longer have your ambush. They know you're there and they're coming for you. Eh, fun. And again, um, if I, as an NPC, uh, the entity, whatever, roll a botch, I've got to turn a dark token light. And there are a couple of instances where a token gets added. So your standard case, your envoys will get wind of, you know, something occurring somewhere. They go to the site. The entity is not going to know the unknown will not be aware of their presence initially. But eventually, as the, you know, they're asking questions, they're sticking their nose in different places. They're going to do something that will alert the unknown of their presence. When they do that, you add a dark token to the table. And then there are certain very powerful disciplines of the evil way that may require more than one token being turned light or require a light token be added to the table. Those are the only ways a new token is going to get added. But as you can see, that really plays into the whole balance thing. But, and this is where I had my difficulty with the whole thing. If it were just that, that would be very constraining because as a chill master, maybe I've got a scene. I'm like, man, this would be awesome to have that, you know, creature's ability to create this giant fog and just have it cover the town. That'd be an awesome scene. Ah, oh, it'd be great. And I look down, there are no dark tokens that I can turn light. Oh, so that awesome thing I can't do to make the scene more awesome unless I fudge the rules. That's what I thought. I was wrong. Let us continue. So aside from the tokens, because it's the same way, it's not just, you know, wanting to do cool stuff as a chill master. If you want to use the art and there are no light tokens as an envoy, you'd be screwed. You don't want to have this cool ability and then not be able to use it, right? So you have other methods of doing things and getting the same effect as turning a token without actually turning a token. One of those is your drive. 
let us turn to the drive. So, let's see what it says here. I mean, basically, your drive is your motivation for doing what you do. It would be very easy to have your first encounter with the unknown, freak the fuck out, and get out of Dodge, and never want to look back. I once had... Did I mention that already? Maybe I did. I think I did. Yes, I did. I won't mention it again. So your drive is your motivation of why you're doing this. Basically, it's... I'm fighting the unknown because. And uh, on your character sheet, you will have a light box and a dark box next to your drive. So during the game, say you need to do something that would require you to flip a token, and either A, you don't want to flip a token, or B, there are no tokens, light ones, to flip. You can check the light box on your drive if you think your drive applies to the current situation and it allows you to do anything you would be able to do if you had actually turned a token. That's if you check the light box. If you check the dark box, that is if you believe your drive could lead to a problem for your character. Maybe it's pushing you to do something foolish, impulsive, or dangerous. You tell the chill master that you're marking the dark box and the chill master will then make the current situation difficult for you. Basically, it's like, kind of like the, uh, there's there again, the chill master flipping a token to uh, make an inconvenience, that sort of thing. Only by doing that and checking that dark box, you get to turn a token light. So that's drives. Every character at the table, every PC, every envoy, will have a drive. So that's, say you've got four players at the table, that's four opportunities for an essential uh, facsimile of flipping a token. But it does not in there. Every character also has takeaways personal takeaways and arcane takeaways. So a takeaway is as you go through different uh, cases as a member of SAVE, there are things that you take away from that, just like any other job. That's how you learn. So you write up your takeaway as something minor, but something that could be used either as a positive or a negative. And Again, just like with the drive, your takeaways will have a light box and a dark box. If you make use of a personal takeaway and check the light box, that allows you to add 10 to your target number or reduce the trauma rank of a resolve check when reducing damage. If you, actually, this is the fun part. The light and a dark box, you can check the light box and get either of those two things made available to you. The dark box is something the chill master can tell you. Check the dark box. Yeah. Yeah. So what can that do? Chill master tells you to uh, mark the dark box and you can boost the target number of a creature or raise an NPC's target number by 10. So the example they give here, uh, this character has a takeaway of father was killed by a Wendigo. On a case she's on, she and her local envoys uh, are staking a, a spot out. Local authorities find them staking this place out and want to know what the hell they're doing. So now there's that risk of, okay, we're trying to be quiet and stick this place out. Now the cops are here. If it catches wind, we're all screwed. She could use her takeaway to add 10 to the target number on her communications check to talk these cops down and convince them to just stay back and out of the way. The reverse of that, say things 
get out of hand. Maybe she failed the role anyway, or didn't choose to take the, use that takeaway. And the cops are pulling out the handcuffs, or maybe they pull out their weapons, like you need to get out on your hands and knees now. And maybe that's when the creature attacks. So Jill Master can say, go ahead and mark the dark box on that personal takeaway and then give a plus 10 to the creature when it attacks during the firefight, or maybe give a plus 10 to one of the cops. And then arcane takeaways are from direct exposure with the unknown. What you can do if you check the light box on an arcane takeaway is activate one of your disciplines of the art or sense the unknown or use it to gain an insight so between the personal and the arcane you kind of get the full effect of what you might be able to do by flipping a token and then if the chill master says check the dark box on an arcane takeaway they can use that to activate one of the disciplines to either way for the unknown and you may think okay Takeaways are stuff I've learned. Am I going to have the same takeaways through the entire life of my character? No. You can change takeaways. You can add new takeaways as your character progresses. So it's not going to be like you're continually falling back on. Remember that time? Nothing like that. Um, system wise, that really is about it. It's not that difficult. Uh, skills are very broad, though you can have specialties. So like under ranged weapons, maybe you're specialized in handguns or rifles. With the history that it gives you, it is not difficult to set your campaign at largely any time from their beginnings to current day, much like Call of Cthulhu. Cthulhu's default is the 1920s, but you got stuff happening all as far as the timeline goes. Uh, you get a overview of different houses throughout the world. You know, uh, which ones exist, what they do, who's in charge of it, that sort of thing, what they believe in. You get a host of disciplines of the art to choose from. And then, of course, creating missions and how to deal with that. Uh, the layout is pretty, pretty standard. I think I might, may have mentioned that. Um, as a photographer, I was really keen on the fact that they used photographs in this. Some of them weren't the, the greatest. And then there was there's always that inevitable clash if you try to use photos and illustrations combined, because you have to be really careful to try and have an illustrator that can capture that kind of photographic quality. Otherwise, there's gonna be a, a jarring change as you see the two. Which again, having the comic book in the front and then you've got photographs like, ah, okay. But I applaud them for, you know, at least trying it. So I'm, I think I mentioned, this is not a dead game. It's just a game that is, your average player who doesn't know where to look is not gonna find this game. You might find it still out on some shelf in some gaming store somewhere, maybe. It's been a while, so I, don't, I honestly don't know. But on, yeah, the initial hardback book, uh, chips, the dice that came with the Kickstarter. There were three other successful Kickstarters. One was for the save source book. Uh, another for monsters and the last one for the undead. Or well, those two, I may have those two reversed. They were essentially uh, creating third edition versions of books that had occurred in second edition. 
So I was fully expecting like a lycanthropes book, a vampire book, maybe even a you know book of the art. I don't want to dig into why the company Growling Door Games dissolved or imploded. I will just say, if you want to look it up, Growling Door Games is probably won't be hard to find. You had the head of the company was not a a good actor. Did some pretty heinous stuff and closed up. So here's a silver lining there. Uh, Martin Curran is the owner of the Chill intellectual property. He has been. He licensed it out to Growling Door Games to create third edition. When they folded, it all went back to him. So all their material and whatnot all went back to him. That is actually how I got, I bought a set of these dice for all my players. I bought tons of uh, tokens to make sure I had them. They all came in the cool little Indalo bed. And as of this video, I mean, he, I contacted him, contacted him through the chill Facebook group because periodically he would pop up and say, hey, I've got a bunch of these books. Contact me and I, we can, you know, I can ship them to you. So I've got, I believe, four copies of the core book, tons of dice and whatnot. So I'm ready to play. So, and I want to point out, yes, the developer of Growling Door Games, the owner, was a bad guy. If you look at the credits on the core book, he's listed as developer and one of the writers. There were many writers. A lot of people made this game. A lot of writers made those source books. The stretch goals for those free adventures that are available are all different authors beyond this guy. So I don't want anyone to trash a game because of one person's hate his axe. That's all I'm saying. But all that cast aside, the game is still available. Drive Through RPG has PDFs. I believe Martin has it's either IPR or Lightning Source. He's got the books available for print. Salt Circle Games, a year or two ago, started the move to continue the line. They have produced one digital book thus far. It's a book of uh, more creatures. And as of uh, this past week, today is August 4th, uh, 2024. It's the last day of Gen Con. As of this past week, they mentioned both on the Facebook page and on their Discord, they've been working on a Atlanta source book. That should be out by the end of 2024. And they have also been making the baby steps into a fourth edition of the game. Now, I'm guessing it's going to have to be a Kickstarter. They're a very small company. Creating these games is not an easy task. I know I've, I've, I've done graphic design on these things. My very first graphic design gig was I had one semester of, I was still in, in, in school. I had one semester of uh, design under my belt and I got to uh, lay out a 252 page book. You wanna talk about a daunting task. So it's not easy. And it's usually a labor of love because despite how much we love playing these games and buying this stuff, they don't really make anybody a ton of money. Never has. The old saying has always been, if you want to make a little money in RPGs, start off with a lot of money. So that being said, the game is not dead. I urge you, if you are a fan of horror as a genre, horror games, give Chill a look. That whole balancing thing is really cool because it plays out from not you know the background, the history of the setting into the system. And it works. And you could do anything from, I mean, they mentioned, without mentioning names, Sam and Dean in here. So you could pull a, a completely do a supernatural RPG. You could do a Scooby-Doo. Not sure how you do Scooby, but you could do a full Scooby-Doo kind of thing. 
there's a lot it can do that you wouldn't necessarily want to do with a game like, say, Call of Cthulhu. In particular, if you are not wanting to deal with the cosmic stuff, if you do want to deal with just like ghosts and demons and vampires and werewolves and doppelgangers and that sort of thing, Mothman's kind of stuff, this is the game for you. Because you won't have to worry about trying to twist it and giving it some sort of Lovecraftian alternate dimension background. It's a great game. I urge you to pick it up. I will probably look into taking some dives into the source books, particularly that save book. I mean, I, I, I love that setting. I love it. But that is chill. That is what it gives you. It's that whole balance of light and dark that really separates it from other games. If that is the sort of thing that you think would appeal to you and your players, I urge you pick the game up. All you need is some percentile dice and some sort of poker chips and you're good to go. So I will see you all later. I have recently got my hands on the Gaslight Investigator's Guide for Call of Cthulhu. So Cthulhu will probably be next. It and Delta Green are most definitely next on the list and then probably will be followed by Vassin since I'm going to be running that game. So also on the channel, be on the lookout for the Vassin actual play and I hope I didn't ramble too much. I'll be honest with you, this is like the fourth video I've done on chill because I didn't like the first one. Didn't really like the second one. Battery ran out on my audio receiver on the third one and battery ran out on the camera on, okay, I guess it's like the fifth one. Wow, Jesus. So anyway, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, look forward to more Gazing into Darkness. We'll do deep dives into all these games and figure out whether or not they're the game for you. So I'll see you then.